Hello and welcome. Today's video we're going to be discussing the basics of matcha. Uh, matcha has been in the news the past few years, getting a lot of steam over here in the West. There are a lot of health benefits which have been cooperated by Western medicine, uh, scientific studies into green tea and matcha specifically. Green tea gets most of the funding dollars for research into the health benefits of tea, but tea in general has many health benefits. So what exactly is matcha? Matcha comes from two Japanese words, ma and cha, meaning rubbed and tea. So it's a rubbed tea. So to be matcha, it has to be made from Japanese tea. You can get other powdered green teas, for example, uh, this I got from Yunnan Sourcing, this is a powdered green tea, but this is not matcha because this was made in China, not Japan. So what type of tea is it exactly? So it is made from uh, gyokuro, which is jade dew, a type of Japanese tea that is often consumed whole leaf. But they start with those green tea leaves, but instead of rolling them as you would in a traditional gyokuro, they lie them flat and dry them out. Gyokuru is a shade-grown tree, uh, up to 20 days in the shade, and that prevents direct sunlight from reaching the tree tea, which increases both the chlorophyll and the theanine content, which is what gives its well-known umami characteristics, that almost broth, chicken broth almost type of flavors with that tea. So once those flat leaves are dry, then that's known as tencha. The tencha leaves are then typically de-veined and de-stemmed, so you're just left with kind of the meaty bits of the leaf, and then those pieces are then stone ground, and they have to be ground very slowly to prevent heat buildup, which could damage the leaves. It can take up to about an hour to produce 30 grams of matcha, which is typically the most common size that you'll see found for sale. Once the matcha has been ground, it will be graded into one of three different grades, either ceremonial, which is the highest grade and is used appropriately enough for the Japanese tea ceremony, also known as chan no yu. There's also premium, which is just a high grade, a daily drinker style. And then there's the cooking or culinary grade, which is a cheaper grade, often has a slightly more bitter flavor and is used to flavor things like ice cream or lattes, milkshakes. Uh, there's a matcha Kit Kat that's very popular in Japan as well. So that is modern day true matcha, but the actual history of matcha dates all the way back to the eighth century in China. So Chinese Chan, their version of Zen monks, they would take the green tea, which had been stored, uh, completely pressed like a puer cake and then they would just take and break off little pieces and put it in a mortar and pestle and then grind that into a powder, whisk that with hot water in a wide shallow bowl and then drink the resulting liquid. It was kind of um, an artistic pursuit at that point. Sometime later around 1180s, a Japanese Buddhist monk by the name of Aisai traveled to China and there he discovered both Zen Buddhism and the powdered green tea and he dedicated his life to teaching both of those concepts, Zen and Matcha, as they were then named in Japan. The consumption and appreciation of Matcha was ranked highly among other traditional Japanese arts, and eventually the tea master Senno Rikyu in the 16th century formalized the official tea ceremony. Along with the Matcha itself, there are a few other implements that are common to the actual consumption of Matcha in the traditional Chanoyu ceremony or just at home drinking. So you'll have the chasen, which is the tea whisk, chawan, which is the tea bowl. This particular chawan is, has a more concave bottom. You often find them with a more shallow flat bottom. There's also the cha sha ku, which is the tea scoop used to take the tea powder and place it in the chawan. You have the natsume, which is the container for holding your matcha. Along with that, there's also what's called the chaki, which is used in the tea ceremony. Once you take it out of the natsume and then you sieve it, then you would take that pre-sieved matcha and put it into the chaki and take that into the tea ceremony. Then you also have the chakin which is just a tea towel. To store your matcha, you want to use a light blocking, airtight container and store it in the refrigerator. These 
um, containers I got from Breakaway Matcha. They have a little seal on the top here and then completely opaque black and then I just store those in uh, a little mini fridge with all of my other matcha to consume your matcha. So now that we know all the pieces, we know the history of matcha, let's actually drink some matcha. There are what I'm going to call three brewing methods for matcha. There are two traditional methods. One is known as usu cha or thin and koi cha also known as thick. And then there is a more modern style which I'm going to call just the breakaway matcha style because uh, I learned the method from breakaway matcha. So usu cha, the thin, takes approximately one and a half heaping scoops of matcha, place that into the chawan, and then add about 75 milliliters of water. The temperature recommendations you'll see will vary from one site to another. Uh, breakaway matcha, for example, says to use no hotter than 74 degrees Celsius. I like to use about 70. That's what I've found works pretty well for me, but feel free to play around with it yourself. It really helps if you have a nice electric kettle that can hold a temperature for you. This one is set to hold on 70 degrees Celsius for me. So as I continue through the process, it's just going to hold it at 70 the whole time we're brewing our different styles here. So let's try brewing a usucha thin. So you want approximately 1.75 grams or 1.5 heaping scoops. I'm going to use just the, the scoop method and we're going to go with one. And this is one and a half heaping so I'm going to go just a little bit less. Nice bright vibrant green matcha here. And between our styles I'm going to go ahead and Close that back up. And then for our thin style, we want to use approximately 75 milliliters of water. And so this one I'm not as well versed on, so I'm going to just take it over here to my scale, place it on, we'll tear that out. So we're looking for 75. And then you want to take your chasin and then you just want to go in kind of this W pattern to give it a good whisking. And you want to make sure you get all from the bottom here. Some preparation methods recommend that you start with just a small amount of water and kind of build up a paste at first. All right. Now there is a little, little like caddy that you can use to put your whisk on after you finish whisking. I was not able to get a really good head of crema using that method. Um, I know plenty of people can and have much more success. Now this is the thin method, so it's going to naturally be slightly less crema just using that thin usu cha. Cheers. Let's drink it. Very good. I, I typically prefer the slightly thinner preparation myself. Okay, so that is our usu cha, our thin preparation. So now for our koi cha, we want to use 3.75 and this is three heaping scoops. So, we'll do one, oh dear, two, and three. Now we've increased the amount of matcha, but we're going to decrease the amount of liquid. So we'll turn our scale back on, and this time we just want to add approximately 40 milliliters. There we go. A little bit more, but not too bad. So again, we'll take our chasin and start to whisk up the matcha. Okay, I can see with the extra matcha and less water, I was able to build up a much better crema this time. Much less liquid, obviously. And this is the, the koi cha, the thick method, known to be a milder and sweeter. Uh, and this is typically what is served during the Japanese tea ceremonies. Cheers. Oh, wow. I've actually never made koi cha style before. Quite a bit different. Much sweeter. Wow.
That's really good. Obviously that method uses much more of your matcha, so if you're on a budget, doing the uh, usucha method will stretch your supply of matcha longer. The last method, which is a more modern style, is the, the breakaway matcha method. Uh, I got this directly from the breakaway matcha website. So in this case, I'm not gonna use the chasen at all. Okay, for this method, I recommend using one gram, which is about one scoop, sieved into a tumbler, then add 60 milliliters of hot water, and then we're going to use the electric aerator, the electric milk frother, to do our actual agitation and mixing of the matcha and water. Let's take our sieve, place it on the tumbler. This is the method I've been using primarily for drinking my matcha. Put one gram in, and we'll just sieve that through. Now I do this in two steps personally, so I will put in about 30-ish mils to start, because that electric frother really gets it going, and I often <laughs> will spill if I have too much in here at one time. So I'll do about 30 to start with. It doesn't have to be exact, right? But Now I also typically use a different tumbler, but I wanted to use a glass one for the camera here, so we'll hopefully see me not spill this everywhere. So I just, before turning it on, I try and get it going a little bit here, make sure there's nothing stuck on the bottom, and then side and then I'll top it off with the remaining 30-ish grams bring it right up a little bit more well 61 not bad so 60 grams in this tumbler looks like that nice nice crema as you saw just really beats that up and puts a nice head of crema on top of your matcha for you so last method cheers I really liked the koi cha, that's quite a different experience, but for just everyday drinking, this version, the breakaway matcha version, is excellent. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, your introduction into matcha and how to drink it. Stay tuned because in the next video I'm going to be announcing a big experiment I'm doing to find the perfect matcha for me. That'll be a fun journey. We'll be going through the entire month of March with it, and I hope to see you along for the ride. Bye.